We all know Wi-Fi. But do you know why geek Can you imagine what it is? Invented by Elon Musk, where everything is called Giga? No, not really. Still, we will talk about gigahertz and gigabit per second. After the video, you will know the next frontier of Wi-Fi. As a bonus, I will tell you the story about why we do not need a license to use Wi-Fi. Spoiler! It is because of microwave ovens. Gritty YouTubers, here is the guy with the Swiss accent, with a new episode and fresh ideas around sensors and microcontrollers. Remember, if you subscribe, you will always sit in the first row. We all know 2.4 and 5.8 GHz Wi-Fi. 5.8 GHz is faster and, in many areas, less crowded than 2.4 GHz. What would you say if I were to test 60 GHz devices with a promised data rate of 1 gigabit per second and see how far it goes? Spoiler, its range is longer than you think. All wireless systems need bandwidth to transport data. As a rule of thumb, the higher the data rate, the wider the signal. However, a higher bandwidth needs a higher power to bridge a particular distance. Let's quickly recap the history of Wi-Fi. As we know, it all started with 2.4 GHz Wi-Fi. But why exactly in this band? Governments own the overall radio spectrum and grant licenses to organizations that need them. Governments sell these licenses at high prices. In recent years, they have made billions with new mobile communication frequencies. But for 2.4 GHz, we do not need to pay for a license. Why is that? Because 2.4 GHz is a so-called ISM band. Why did they give away such valuable space for free? This decision was made by the FCC in 1985, when these high frequencies were hardly used for communication because equipment was extremely expensive. Back then, only one relatively cheap device was able to produce 2.4 GHz. Microwave ovens. Why did they use this band? Because signals on this frequency heat water with high efficiency. And food contains lots of water. The FCC feared many interferences created by these microwave ovens. So they decided that nobody was interested in buying communication frequencies in this band. That is why we got free access to this chunk band. And from there everything started. A similar thing happened with the 60 GHz band. This time the reason was not water, it was oxygen. Oxygen has its highest attenuation right at 60 GHz. So in plain air these signals do not travel far. In 2003, when the decision was made, nearly no equipment was available for 60 GHz. So the FCC decided with a similar pattern. A useless band on an extremely high frequency cannot be sold. So they gave it for free to the public. But now we are in 2023. Oxygen still has its high absorption. But now communication devices are available for reasonable prices. And because nearly nobody uses this band, we do not experience interference as in the 2.4 or 5.8 GHz band. Cool! When my colleague Peter told me that these devices are legally available, I wanted to try them. And here they are. Two Microtik Cube 60 Pro AC. They work on 60 GHz and can be used to replace Ethernet cables because their maximum speed is 1 gigabit per second. Unbelievable! And more to come. They claim a 2.4 km range. Even harder to believe. But there are some small prints. Only with Channel 5 support. Without it, it should work up to 1 km. I found no information on this secret Channel 5 support. But I have a suspicion. Later more. 
The first question is, why are such high data rates possible? We all know that the bigger the bandwidth, the higher the possible transfer speed. Between 60 and 70 MHz, only 10 MHz bandwidth is available. Between 60 and 70 GHz, there is 1000 times more usable bandwidth. The higher the frequency, the more bandwidth is available. Simple. 2.4 GHz Wi-Fi only uses 20 MHz channels. The channels on the 60 GHz band are 2.1 GHz wide. Yes, you heard right. One channel has the same bandwidth as all other radios below 2.1 GHz, including FM stations and mobile phones. There are four such channels available for most countries. The US allows two more, channels 5 and 6. The 5.8 GHz band is in between the 2.4 and 60 GHz band. With its recently added 6 GHz spectrum, it offers speed and capacity for many participants. Unfortunately, this also results in interference in congested areas. There is another huge problem with the 5.8 GHz band. These frequencies are used by weather radars. And because these radars were first, all 5.8 GHz devices have built-in procedures for detect and avoid, listen before talk and dynamic frequency selection. Such connections are sometimes slow at startup and unreliable during operation, particularly outdoors. They can immediately stop if an unknown signal is detected. By the way, some military radar systems work on the G-band and have ranges of more than 100 kilometers. Not bad for them. Not good if your 5.8 GHz link has to stop because of such signals. So the 60 GHz band seems to be a good alternative for outdoors. Extremely fast without interference, right? Unfortunately not. Rain and snowfall can interfere and reduce its speed or maximum distance. As we will later see, these microtech units take this into account. Enough theory. Now comes the test, where the rubber meets the road. I ordered these two 60 GHz cubes for 130 euros each. But before we can use them, we have to do some setup. I leave a link in the description to the only video I found. It is in Dutch, but you should be able to follow it because I do not know what this mysterious channel 5 support is, I decided to go for a slightly shorter distance. Still very far, if you ask me. I found this place with a line of sight to the window of my radio room. I mounted one of the devices in my window and connected it to the home network. With a second cube on a tripod, a PC, a Life Apo 4 battery and a 24 volt boost converter, I drove and walked to this cozy fireplace on the other side of our valley. Distance 1.5 kilometers. After the setup, I tried to get a working link. And really, after turning the device towards my home, I got a connection. Unfortunately, with a data rate below 100 megabit per second. Not bad but less than expected. After investigating, I found the reason. As said before, these devices have a backup for heavy rain or snowfall. In addition to the 60 GHz radios, they have built-in 5.8 GHz radios with automatic switchover. Incredible for this price. So this happened. When the connection did not work on 60 GHz, the devices automatically switched to 5.8 GHz with a much lower speed. At least these small and easy to hide devices are good for a 1.5 km connection on 5.8 GHz. But as you know on this channel, we want more. I knew from the datasheet that the opening angle of these devices is only a few degrees. So the alignment has to be pretty exact. But I had nobody to adjust the device on the other side. Being an engineer, I found a solution. I went home, 
put binoculars on top of the cube and checked the direction. And really, it was pretty wrong. So my tip, use binoculars for an initial setup and place one person at each station to do the small adjustments. Before we continue, let's have a quick look at the output power of these devices. The allowed maximum emitted power is 43 dBm or 20 watts. Frequent viewers remember from my recent present detection radar video that creating high output power on these high frequencies is still expensive and consumes a lot of energy. Fortunately, the 60 GHz wavelength is only 5 mm. So antennas with lots of gain are quite small. These antennas get the gain by focusing all energy to a very small opening angle, like a torch. If these antennas had a gain of, let's say, 30 dB, the transmitter needs 1000 times less power. In addition, the receiving signal is amplified by the same factor, very important for the huge bandwidth of 2.1 GHz. But is that gain sufficient to cut through the high oxygen attenuation? I was confident that the bad alignment was the reason for the non-functioning of the 60 GHz link. So I carried the equipment a second time to the fireplace. And really, after aligning the cube with the binoculars, I got a 60 GHz connection. And I discovered another function. The user interface shows how good your antenna alignment is. Do not ask me how they do it, but it works. If you have a second person on the other side, a perfect alignment is easy. The speed was only around 430 megabit per second, not the promised 1 gigabit. Looking at the raw data, I saw the reason. Because of the distance and the weak signal, many retransmissions were needed. The rain also did not help. The raw data was more than 1.2 gigabit per second to get a 430 megabit per second net data rate. Still not bad. And maybe with a perfect alignment on the other side, it would be possible to reach the maximum even across 1.5 kilometers. Because I remembered the problem of the oxygen attenuation, I changed to, to channel 4 for the second test. The further away from the maximum oxygen attenuation, the better. And this might be the secret behind channel 5 support. Channel 5 is probably a good compromise. It is away from the oxygen attenuation losses and not at the top of the available spectrum, where the device probably has some additional losses. But living in Switzerland, I cannot tell you if this is the truth behind this small print. Maybe you know more? Or you live in the US where you are allowed to use channel 5 and 6. Then you can test and report back. Now the important question. Where can you use such devices? First, they look very much like a camera and therefore are nearly invisible. So for any outdoor Wi-Fi connection, they are sometimes better suited than the typical 5.8 GHz dishes. Also, they do not suffer from interferences. And of course, if you need speed, this is the perfect solution. And who does not want speed? They are optimal for point-to-point -point connections, but you also get devices with bigger opening angles for point-to-multipoint nets. These devices have lower gain and a shorter range. All in all, a fascinating technology with a low price tag for two built-in radios, including failover. Let's see how this Y-Geek technology will develop in the future. This was all for today. As always, you find all the relevant links in the description. I hope this video was useful or at least interesting for you. If true, please consider supporting the channel to secure its future existence. Thank you. Bye.